Hello, and welcome to the Media Center's 11th Local Hero Award series, in which we showcase six people from the Mid-Peninsula for outstanding achievement or contributions to the community. We solicited nominations and were especially looking for the unsung heroes. Each winner is an inspiration and each has a great story to tell. Living in California, probably most of us know at least someone who has made an undocumented and harrowing journey from Mexico to the U.S. Nora Bezon was one of these immigrants. But her story is slightly different from many and frequently defies any stereotype. At almost every turn, by choice or by chance, things have been turned upside down or taken on a crucial twist. After living several years in this country, she now works at the primary school in East Palo Alto, creating a new model that integrates health and education with parent support. Nora, you've had a life of significant hardship. And I'd like to start out with what maybe some of the hardest parts first, if it's all right with you. Tell me about the role of violence in your life. Sure. Um, yes. There are was a significant amount of violence um, early on in my life and in my family's life, uh, a lot of which we're still healing from. Um, my home was a place where there, there was uh, violence. My dad was an alcoholic, um, probably still is, not really in my life anymore. Uh, and he, he was violent. He physically, emotionally um, violent towards you know, all members of my, my family, and um, that really tainted a lot of my childhood. Um, at one point, I went to foster care um, early on. I, it's one of my earliest memories, um, being three years old, being taken um, by social services, and um, it really it's one of your, my earliest memories. It's also one of um, my hardest memories, and I think it's a hard memory for my family uh, to because to, it was now we were out. You know, uh, by, domestic violence is a very private matter, and having uh, social service get involved now makes it a public matter. Um, and and so it's always been something that we don't talk about, but it's something that I remember very vividly um, as being kind of the the beginning of my memories of my home life. Wow. Now, w one of those twists in your life, you often hear about foster care um, being really problematic for people. You had a different experience. Tell me about that. Yes. Uh, I've reflected a lot on my foster care experience um, as an adult. Um, and I have heard, you know, stories and um, very real stories about foster care not being a uh, a positive place or space for a lot of people. Um, for me, I've realized that I actually picked up a lot of resiliency through that experience, and it actually um, exposed me to a different reality uh, that I still, I, I think, really helped me through other experiences in my life. Where I, I went to a foster care, a couple foster care homes, where there was families that talked to each other, that um, where children played and there wasn't fear. Um, where I felt cared about um, and not in fear of the adults. And so for me, it, it really helped me see that there was another way of being in a home and another way of interacting with parents and parents interacting with their kids. And so for me, it, it helped me come back when I did come back to my family to even though when violent, the violence continued or came back again, um, I didn't normalize it anymore. It was, I knew that that wasn't right. I knew that the things that were happening were not things that I wanted to have in my life for a long time, that I wanted to have a different reality for myself, for my siblings, for my, you know, as an adult, for my kids. Um, and that's where it started for me, wow. seeing other people's homes. At such a young age. Yes. And then at age seven, uh, well, you went back to your family. Another kind of flip side you went through the harrowing experience of an illegal immigration to the U.S., went back to Mexico, and you were the outsider. Tell me about that. Yes. Uh, I was seven years old. Um, it's a 
the summertime after second grade and my family packs up uh, our truck and we drive down to Mexico, um, which was this imaginary land to me because I didn't have memories. I was brought uh, to the United States when I was two. And like I said, you don't remember those. I heard the stories, I didn't remember anything. And so coming uh, to a small rural community in the state of Jalisco at age seven um, and meeting family members I had never met before and um, knowing that I'd been born there. So I was definitely where I belonged, but it was unexpected um, to go to school and then realize that I didn't understand um, as much Spanish as my parents thought I did. And I definitely didn't sound like the other children in the classroom. Um, so it was uh, a humbling experience to be an E, not an English as a second language learner, but a Spanish as a second language learner in, in the country I was born in. Wow. Uh, so it was a hard time uh, for the few couple of years. Well, and you got rescued, if, if that isn't too strong a word, certainly inspired by a particular teacher that you said changed your life. Yes. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I, um, we got an, I got a new teacher. Uh, and I, uh, el profesor Jose Angel, um, who was just a different teacher, even as I've met a lot of teachers in my life as, you know, as a student in the United States and um, as an adult that now works with teachers. He worked in a small rural community, had no more than 10 students, and yet he treated us like scholars. He questioned what we thought. He allowed us to question what he thought. He presented us with supplementary books that were not um, provided by the government and you know, really encouraged us to dig deep into everything that we were um, learning. And I, I just remember feeling like it was such a, a safe place for me to explore and to, to think of different realities and possibilities for myself. And, I, and this was unusual because again, mm -hmm. this is a small rural community and the, the likelihood that any of us would leave that community ever in our life, there was no middle school option for us for miles. There was no high school option for us for miles, and yet he treated us like we were going to go to Harvard one day. Um, that I, I that saved me, in, in not just intellectually, but just to feel like you are an important being at age eight, nine. Well, in fact, you were one of the few who did leave. Yes. And. Again, in a strange twist of fate, you came back as an outsider to East Palo Alto in sixth grade. What kind of culture shock was that? Yes. So I came back in sixth grade, and this was 1997, um, to East Palo Alto, which is uh, in the Silicon Valley. Um, and I come, it's the middle of sixth grade, and I remember my, like, third class in the day was a computer lab class. And so now um, I hadn't spoken English in like five to six years. Uh, and so I'm hearing English and that's a little, you know, just it's taking me aback. It's taken me a significant effort to understand what's going on. And then there's these computers, these PCs. Um, and when I had left the United States before, like there were, I remember Macs, those little square Macs. Mm -hmm. and there was none of that. There was these new computers and there was the internet. And so aside from realizing that I needed to really brush up on my English and speed my things up to understand what was going on, there was these computers that I now needed to figure out because I was behind. Um, I realized about four months later that nobody knew what was going on, that this was new to everybody in the community and the region. Um, but by that point, I had um, made a, uh, myself a, a space in the computer lab during recess, during lunch, after school, trying to figure out how these computers worked, what the internet was. And I observed the computer lab teacher like add hard drives, take hard drives away, troubleshoot printers, and you know, just by observation actually learned a lot. Um, and then suddenly I was the go-to person to fix things and to figure things out on the computers. And um, <laughs> there. <laughs> 
where I thought I didn't, I was behind, I now realize that uh, an entire community was behind. So you went from feeling like one of the, the worst kids in class to one of the best. The more the e I thought I, I was behind and then I turned out to be the most competent in terms of, you know, the technology use um, because mm -hmm. I, I put so much effort into trying to catch up. Turns yeah. out nobody yeah. um, had been exposed to any of this prior either. All this time and for a long time after that, you were undocumented and you didn't tell anybody about it. What was that like? Uh, it was a lot like not speaking about how my family was treated at home. <laughs> you know, there was things that were private matters. You know, we didn't talk about my dad drinking alcohol. We didn't talk about my dad uh, being violent um, in any way. And we didn't talk about not having documents to prove any citizenship status in this country either. We didn't talk, there were private matters and there were things that if other people found out, it would jeopardize our family being together and being able to support each other. So it, I was silent. It was my internal business and who I was publicly um, was not documented. It was, I was Nora. Um, and I tried my best and I tried not to stand out as much as possible, um, but to do well enough to also not stand out. So you had two Noras going on. I had and you said it was your internal business. Was it all that silence, that secret? Was it also an internal struggle? Was it hard? Yeah, uh, it, it was, it's definitely hard um, because your, your silence protects you and it also protects your family. Um, and then you don't know who else is going through the same situation, though you have your, uh, I definitely knew there were other people, but there was no way that we would identify each other because again, um, you didn't know who you could trust. And again, we're talking about the late 90s and in California particularly at that time was a, a very hard time to be an immigrant. There was a lot of scapegoating. You didn't know how people felt, even teachers, right, who you know definitely wanted to come and teach and do their best, but you don't know what their political um, biases might be. And so just keeping things to, keeping that and being invisible in many ways um, about that was uh, was hard, um, and then not knowing I, at that early on, even in middle school, I, I realized that the educational opportunities for undocumented students were very limited. That going to college was going to be a very unlikely situation for myself. Mm -hmm. That um, that that didn't that wasn't something that was available to students that didn't have um, documents. Um, so it was also, it was a struggle to be silent and also to know that my status, um, that there was only so much I, so, so far I could go. But of course that all changed at, when you went to college track and um, in part that was related to you breaking your silence as it were. And this came um, with another mentor attached. Yes. What happened there? So I actually didn't, I, <laughs> I still uh, applied to be part of college prep programs. Um, they seem like good places to be. And what if something changed and I wasn't prepared to go to college? So uh, College Track was recruiting uh, and so I became part of the program. I helped recruit like a lot of my friends to come and be part of the program. I got the tutoring. There was all these programs, you know, I did the community service. I did everything um, and I helped. Uh, you know, build out this program in many ways as a student and just build relationships with the staff. Um, and Marshall Lott, the director, um, the first director, and I think staff member number one was one of the people who really um, I connected with. He had a lot of the same qualities as my teacher in Mexico, really seeing the best in me and treating me and acknowledging me through my strengths. Um, and so it was really easy for me actually to forget that I was undocumented in that space except when I had to apply to college um, because that was kind of the whole point of the program, right? That you're gonna apply to college, but then I hadn't shared that I can't apply to college. It's a crucial detail. I can't, and I, it took me, I remember like a week before applications where do I finally broke down and shared that I was undocumented and I apologized, I remember. Uh, because I felt like I had let them down. You've invested all of this time on me and all 
and I can't actually go to college. What happened once you opened up? Surprising um, to me at that time uh, that I didn't disappoint them. That the, the reaction was uh, that they felt this was an injustice. Um, and I, I, I started seeing people, adults around me, um, problem solve with me. And like many other situations before that, I mean, uh, I'd moved out of my house when I was 16. I'd had all the, this adversity already that they were aware of. And like, it seemed at times that I might break and not want to continue with my efforts to, to be different, to go to college. To, and I remember Marshall always asked, do you still want to do this? Every time, every time something happened and he would look at me and I said, yes, and then he's like, we're going to figure it out. And so as I opened up about being undocumented, he, he said, you know, and I could see he had no answers about how this was going to happen, right? Because I would Googled everything already, or by th back then it was like Yahoo or something. And, but he still asked the same question, Nora, do you still want this? And I said, yes, I still want this. And so he said, we're going to figure it out. OK, fast forward. You went to San Francisco State, and um, the punchline, the, the happy ending is you are now documented. Uh, but another twist was your path to documentation was a very unusual one. Tell me about that experience. Um, so I, I self-petitioned um, to adjust my status through what at the time, I think now there are U visas, but at the time um, the Violence Against Women's Act provides an option for uh, women or children uh, that have experienced abuse to self-petition, um, especially when their status might be dependent on the abuser, which was entirely my case, but it was really hard for me to ever connect these two dots, the violence in my home and my undocumented status. Um, because again, there were private matters that we didn't talk about publicly, but we also kind of were like, we didn't talk about privately very much either, or we didn't. And so um, for me, it, it was, um, I was 20 years old and I had known about this piece of law, but I hadn't gone there with myself. And I remember going to, um, I'd been asked by an, a lawyer before who was connected to one of my mentors about, have you heard about this? Because I think people had like suspicions, but like I didn't give away any, I never admitted to anything. And so um, there's this piece of law that, have you heard about it? And so I'd read about it, um, but you had, to be, you had to be able to provide proof that something, um, that there was violence in your home and that it was connected to your document, being undocumented. So I remember going to social, the social service office and, um, asking for my record. By that point, I had um, the Mexican consulate had provided IDs, which was something I didn't have before. Um, so I went and I took my passport, and they, they looked up my records, and they, and they remember the lady saying, uh, would you like some water? Would you like some coffee? And I was like, well, why would I need water or coffee? Like, you're just going to photocopy a few documents. And she's like, sit down. I'll bring you some coffee. And so she brought me some coffee, and it took like 30 minutes for her to come back, and then she gave me like this stack of papers. Um, Here's your file. And I took it, and again, I, I tried not to show too much emotion, and I walked to the train. I didn't drive, right? I was undocumented. I uh, couldn't get a driver's license. And so I'm on the train, and I start opening up these documents and start reading about the experience that my family and I had had at three and four years old through social services and what the abuse had looked like and what had prompted um, the foster care experience. And it took me like 20 minutes of reading through these documents to like have a realization of like, wait, this is me they're talking about. This is my story. This, I did. I have experienced this. This is my life. Um, in in that moment, I realized how how connected uh, my undocumented status was to the violence in my home, um, and I was able to use this as 
kind of the, the proof point to, to adjust my status. Um, and I had to be able to turn in my application, get it approved before I was 21. This was three months before my, 30, my 21st birthday. <laughs> It took a lot of uh, effort and a lot of people to help me do this, uh, but I was—I got my approval notice like three days before my 21st birthday. Wow! Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> well, I, it's not been that long, <laughs> has it? It was uh, what it's, recently? It's been about 10 years now. No, but I mean, since you since you've received since you received your your documentation. It's been about 10 years oh, since I adjusted my status. I recently became a citizen a, and I yeah. voted for the first time in my life just this year. Wow, what an election to vote in. Yes. <laughs> uh, you are now on the flip side of things. You are in a position to help other people that are in similar situations. Um, you're working at the, a school. You've done a lot of community work. In all of these, what is the thread between your experiences and what you want to do for the people you're helping? That's a very good question. Um, I, I'm working at a new organization um, where we are working on you know, providing great education and providing and trying to integrate health into what we're providing for students, but also working with their parents. Really, in working with their parents, because as an organization, we believe that if we're not working with the parents, then there's only so much we can do for the children, because their parents are their first teachers, and they, there's so much that they shape about a child's life and how mm -hmm. they come into a classroom, which is something that I truly believe in. Um, I, I really think that my mom would have been a different person to, as a mother, as a, as a woman, had she had extra supports has she had people to, to really confide in and to support her. Um, and so bringing a lot of that, my personal experience, to how we're designing this program so that we are reaching the families that may have private lives that they're not bringing into their public spheres, but they are getting the support to be able to eventually or when they're ready and feel safe because we are providing safe places get the support. Um, so that's informed by my experience and um, I have a lot of hope that what we're going to do is different um, and that I'm the right person to do this work. I'm sure you are. Um, just very quickly, you straddle two cultures. What do you most want the immigrants uh, to know about life here, and what do you most, m most want the rest of us to know about the immigrant culture? There's, I think regardless of whether you're an immigrant or not an immigrant, I think it's important for people to, to see people through their strengths. You know, I think that's what helped me, um, you know, become an exception to a lot of, to a rule, right, that people like me don't make it this far, um, that you know, that we see everybody through their strengths, that we see that everybody has something to offer their communities, um, whether you're an immigrant or not. Uh, in the case of immigrants, I think uh, because being invisible or not sharing your story often kind of mutes other parts of your life, including your strengths, I think it's important to remind um, my people that what they bring what the resiliency, the strength to come to this country to work, to provide for their families, that, that all of that can also be applied in other spheres of their lives and other spheres of our community, that you know, helping their children with their homework or coming to meetings, creating community, um, all of that is possible in this country as well and that there are people that care and that there is so much that, um, that they have to offer still That's, we would be a better place to be. Well, best of luck with your school, with all of your work. Um, congratulations on the award and thank you for coming. Do you know someone who has overcome significant hardship and has an inspiring story to tell? Someone who has sacrificed or given over and above to the community and deserves some recognition? If so, please contact us with your nomination for next year's Local Hero Awards. 
To find out more about our local heroes and to watch interviews with all of the winners, visit our website, midpenmedia.org. At the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center, you can make your own videos and television programs and take classes in all aspects of media production. You can also hire our professional services team. To find out more about that, go to mcproservices.com. Congratulations to all our winners, and thank you for watching.